Hello, and thank you for choosing the Stony Brook Cancer Center for your cancer care and treatment. If you are viewing this presentation, it likely means you or someone close to you has been diagnosed with cancer. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you with education and information about how to manage, minimize, or prevent some of the most common symptoms that people experience as they go through cancer treatment. As we proceed through this presentation, please write down any questions you may think of so that you can ask your oncology team. Cancer cells divide and reproduce more quickly than normal cells do. Chemotherapy drugs interfere with the cancer cell's ability to divide and reproduce. Some chemotherapy drugs are given as an intravenous or IV infusion, which is a liquid form that is given directly into a vein. This may be through an IV line in one of your arms, or your oncologist may recommend that you have a central line, such as an implanted port, pick line, or other type of device inserted. If you receive an implanted port or other central line, this device will need ongoing care and maintenance so that it remains in working order. Your oncology team will provide you with information on caring for your central line. Some drugs may be given as an injection. Other drugs are available in the form of a pill, which is called oral chemotherapy. If your oncology team has recommended oral treatment for you, they will let you know the schedule you should follow for taking them. Some drugs may be taken every day, while others may be taken for a period of days or weeks, followed by a rest period. These drugs require special handling as well, such as wearing gloves to touch the pills. There may also be interactions with other drugs or foods that you would need to be aware of. Sometimes a single drug is given, but often chemotherapy drugs are given in combinations. This is done because some chemotherapy drugs kill cancer cells while they are in the process of dividing, and some kill the cancer cells while they are resting. Some of you may begin chemotherapy treatment after having surgery to remove a tumor, and some of you may have chemotherapy first in order to shrink the tumor before surgery can be done. Your oncology team will determine what type of chemotherapy plan is best for treating your particular type of cancer, based on information from your biopsy and other tests performed to diagnose your cancer. Chemotherapy can injure some of our normal cells that divide quickly, such as the cells of our digestive tract, bone marrow, and our skin and hair. This is why some of you may experience certain side effects. I will be discussing this as we proceed through this presentation. There are other drugs that may be used in your cancer treatment that are not the same as chemotherapy. Other drugs used in cancer treatment may be referred to as biotherapy, immunotherapy, or targeted therapy. Sometimes these terms are used interchangeably but there are some subtle differences between them. Biotherapy drugs, which are sometimes called monoclonal antibodies, or MABs, focus on a specific difference that is found on the cancer cell, but not on normal cells. By binding to this target, it blocks the cell's ability to multiply, which slows down the tumor's growth. Other monoclonal antibodies target the cells of the blood vessels that a tumor uses for oxygen and nutrients, therefore causing the cancer cells to starve. Immunotherapy drugs, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors, work by blocking the pathway that help cancer cells to hide from the immune system therefore allowing the T-cells of our immune system to recognize and destroy the cancer cells. Some drugs are called targeted therapies, and they use particles small enough to get inside the cancer cell to interfere with cell function, which causes the cancer cell to die. 
your oncologist will use information from your biopsy to see if the cells of your cancer have any of these unique differences that may respond to one of these treatments. Different types of cancer have different features, and sometimes even the same type of cancer in two people won't have the same characteristics. Your oncology team will tell you if you will benefit from one of these treatments. It is important to remember that these treatments have side effects as well. Your oncology team will partner with you to monitor any effects on your thyroid gland as well as your liver, lungs, and colon. It is important to report any side effects to your oncology team if you are receiving immunotherapy as soon as possible. Early intervention and management of those side effects help patients to maintain their treatment schedule. Nausea and vomiting are symptoms of great concern for nearly every person about to begin cancer treatment. Chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, also referred to as CINV, happens because the chemo drugs injure the cells lining the stomach and release a substance that activates the part of your brain that causes nausea and vomiting. However, it is important to know that not all chemotherapy drugs cause nausea or vomiting. Your oncology team will tell you if the treatment you will receive might cause mild, moderate, or severe nausea. Acute nausea and vomiting occur within the first 24 hours of receiving your treatment. Delayed onset nausea and vomiting may occur 24 hours to several days after receiving your treatment. Anticipatory nausea and vomiting may occur if you subconsciously associate stimuli such as smells in the clinic or common sights seen at each visit with receiving chemotherapy that made you feel sick. This may cause you to feel sick to your stomach even before you receive your treatment. We want you to know that there are medications and other interventions to help minimize or prevent nausea and vomiting. It is important that you let your oncologist know as soon as possible if you are encountering any problems managing nausea or vomiting. Your oncologist will prescribe anti-nausea medication based on how likely your chemotherapy treatment is to cause this. These drugs may also be called anti-emetics. Most patients have at least one anti-nausea drug ordered as part of their pre-medications, which are drugs given before the chemotherapy drugs to help prevent symptoms from occurring. Some of you may have an anti-nausea medication prescribed to your pharmacy that you would take at home right before you come in for your treatment. Your oncology team will give you instructions about how to take them, and you can always call if you have any questions or concerns about this. Most of you will have an anti-nausea medication prescribed for you to take if you experience nausea and vomiting at home after treatment. You should take the anti-nausea medicine at the first sign of nausea. Do not wait until you feel extremely sick to take it because it will likely not relieve the nausea as well. Or your oncology team may recommend that you take it on a regular schedule after you receive each treatment. Other interventions include adjustments to your diet. If nausea is a problem for you, consider eating smaller amounts of food, but more frequently. Instead of three regular meals each day, you can have five or six smaller ones. Avoid heavy, fried, or spicy foods as well. Dry, bland foods such as crackers or pretzels may help. You may try foods or drinks that contain ginger, such as ginger ale or tea or ginger snaps. Some people find that food odors bother them or make them feel sick to their stomach, 
So letting hot food cool down a bit is easier to tolerate because the smell is less. If there is a food smell that bothers you when you are feeling well, you will definitely want to avoid that if you don't feel well. There are other interventions you can try in addition to anti-nausea medicine. These are considered to be complementary therapies because they may enhance the treatment prescribed by your doctor. Music therapy and guided imagery are distraction therapies that can help you relax and reduce the anxiety you are feeling. You can also try using acupressure wristbands. These bands are commonly used for motion sickness, car, boat, and airplane, but some patients have reported that using them while receiving chemotherapy helped with reducing nausea. They are inexpensive and can be found in most stores in the same place that stomach medications are. A complete blood count is a test that will provide important information to the oncology team about how well your bone marrow is holding up during treatment. Your bone marrow is the place where red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are formed. Each of these cell types are important, and if your chemotherapy treatment is affecting your bone marrow, the amount of these cells may go down. White blood cells are important because they help your immune system in fighting infections. Red blood cells are important because they carry oxygen to your tissues and organs. Platelets are important because they help you to stop bleeding. There are several different types of white blood cells, but the white blood cell that your oncology team is most concerned about is the number of neutrophils in your bloodstream. Neutrophils are important because they are the body's first responder in the event of an infection. If your bone marrow has been suppressed by the chemotherapy treatment, you may have fewer neutrophils available if an infection happens. It takes the bone marrow 7 to 11 days to make a mature neutrophil, but once they are released into the bloodstream, their lifespan is only about 6 to 8 hours. From this, you can see how quickly your body can run out of them. If your neutrophil count drops below the normal level, it is called neutropenia. The word nadir refers to the point in your treatment cycle where your neutrophil count is at its lowest point. Neutropenia may be graded as mild, moderate, or severe. Sometimes your oncologist expects that this will happen and may recommend medication to prevent your neutrophil count from going too low to help your bone marrow recover between treatments. This medicine may be called growth factors. Your oncology team will provide you with additional information if you are going to receive this. If you develop a low neutrophil count, your oncologist may recommend you use what is called neutropenic precautions. These precautions are intended to help protect you from bacteria and other organisms that may be present in food and drinks. Many of the recommendations include frequent hand washing and cleanliness of the areas where you store, make, and eat your food. It is important for you and your family members to become knowledgeable about what food products are safe and what ones are not during this time. To prevent foodborne illness, you and your family members or caregivers should wash their hands for at least 15 seconds with soap and warm water. This should be done before preparing food, during preparation if hands have become contaminated or soiled, and after. Always wash your hands immediately before you eat your meal. Foods that you should avoid if you are neutropenic include any raw or undercooked meats, such as beef or pork, fish, such as sushi or shellfish, poultry, and eggs. Yolks must be fully cooked. Hot dogs should be fully cooked. Do not eat them cold. Nuts that are commercially prepared and in a sealed jar or can are fine, 
but nuts with shells to be cracked or raw nuts are not recommended. You should use pasteurized dairy products and juices and avoid non-pasteurized products. Eating foods from self-service areas, such as salad bars or buffets, is not recommended. For cold cuts and cheeses, it is safer to buy commercially packaged ones instead of from a deli counter. Fresh produce is allowed, but it must be washed thoroughly. You should avoid raw sprouts, though. Add any seasonings to foods before cooking, not after. Once food is cooked, the only seasoning you should add is salt, no pepper after cooking. If your water source is from a private well, you will need to boil your water for at least one minute before it can be used for drinking. If you receive water from the municipal water company, you can use tap water. If you like to use a refillable bottle, it should be washed daily with soap and hot water if it is not dishwasher safe. If you prefer drinking bottled water, you should use the bottle one time only and discard or recycle. For cleaning dishes, utensils, and cookware, we recommend that you use an electric dishwasher. If you do not have a dishwasher, it is best to allow dishes to air dry or dry them with either paper towels or a fresh dish towel. It is also advisable to have separate cutting boards for meat and produce. I would like to talk about some other ways that you can lower your risk for an infection. Over the period of time, weeks or months, that you are receiving treatment, it is important to avoid people who are currently ill or may be recovering from illness. You should also avoid crowded areas where you may be exposed to others who may be ill. In addition to frequently washing your hands or using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, wear a mask and avoid touching your hands to your face, especially your eyes, nose, and mouth. Take a shower or bath every day and use a fresh towel and washcloth each time. You should avoid reusing towels or sharing towels with other family members. If you have pets, dogs, cats, birds, fish, another family member should take care of cleaning up after them. Make sure your pet is up to date on their health visits and that they are groomed regularly. Lastly, you should avoid any sexual activity if you or your partner are experiencing any symptoms of a possible infection. I would like to talk about what symptoms you should call right away for if you experience them, even if it is in the middle of the night. First and foremost is a fever. A fever in a patient who is receiving treatment for cancer is a medical emergency. You should call immediately if you have an oral temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. It is not in your best interest to just take some over-the-counter medication, such as acetaminophen or ibuprofen, and wait until the cancer center is open to call. A cancer patient experiencing a fever after receiving chemotherapy is likely to be neutropenic, and that may mean you are at risk for developing sepsis. If you experience shaking chills but do not have a fever, please call and let us know about that too. It can still be that an infection is in progress. You should also notify your oncology team if you have any of the following symptoms. New cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, or change in the color of your phlegm. Any flu-like symptoms such as body aches or persistent fatigue, severe night sweats, pain or burning when you urinate, or if you have any abnormal discharge, or if you notice any redness, tenderness, or swelling at the site of your IV or around your central line. These symptoms may indicate that an infection is developing. When the cancer center is closed, such as overnights, weekends, and major holidays, 
there is still someone always available for medical emergencies that a patient receiving treatment may develop. This medical provider is called the Oncology Fellow on Call. You can reach the Oncology Fellow by calling the main hospital switchboard at 631-689-8333 and make sure you ask for the Oncology Fellow on Call. The operator will take your information and you should receive a call back shortly. The Oncology Fellow will call you back and let you know if you should come to the emergency room or if you should wait until the clinic is open. Many people who are receiving cancer treatment report the symptom of fatigue. Fatigue related to cancer treatment may cause you to feel physically tired, less sharp mentally, and may affect your emotions. Some people report that sleeping does not improve the fatigue. It may feel distressing. However, there is a difference between fatigue and muscle weakness. A person who has fatigue may have normal muscle strength and endurance, but still feel overwhelmingly tired. And unlike true muscular weakness, fatigue can be overcome in an emergency. One of the best things you can do to help manage fatigue is to try to continue some semblance of your regular daily routine. You may not be able to do everything you did before you started treatment, so you may need to plan some rest periods into your day. If you can do some form of regular physical activity, such as walking outside or on a treadmill, riding a stationary bike, or yoga, Pilates, or stretching, do so if your physical condition allows you to. You should speak with your oncologist about what types of exercise would be best for you. Research into this topic has indicated that people who are being treated for cancer and who perform some form of regular physical activity reported lower levels of fatigue than people who did not. You may need to balance your activity periods with periods of rest. If you need to take a nap, try to keep the nap to 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes tops. If you sleep too long during the daytime, it may interfere with your falling asleep at nighttime, which leads to continuing issues with sleeping at night. We can provide you with additional information about how to manage fatigue and trouble sleeping. One more thing, eating high quality foods that are nutritious and avoiding junk foods may help in managing your fatigue. If you find that your fatigue is so bothersome that it severely impacts your quality of life, please let your oncology team know. While there isn't any magic bullet to make the fatigue go away, we want to help you find ways to manage it. Some types of chemotherapy treatments may affect or cause damage to your nerves, which may cause changes in your sensation, balance, or coordination. This type of nerve damage is called peripheral neuropathy. Changes in sensation that you may feel are tingling, numbness, or burning in your hands, arms, legs, or feet, or a feeling of pins and needles. Or you may notice that you're more sensitive or less sensitive to hot or cold temperatures. Changes in balance that you might notice is difficulty walking or trouble walking with balance. Changes in coordination that you might notice are dropping things, feeling clumsy, or trouble performing motor tasks, such as buttoning up buttons, zipping up zippers, or that your handwriting is not the same, or you are having trouble holding a pen. If you have any of these symptoms, please tell your oncology team as soon as possible so that your symptoms can be properly evaluated. The skin is actually the largest organ in your body, and it is the first line of defense against infection. It is very important to take care of your skin while you are receiving cancer treatment. Apply moisturizer to your skin daily, 
and alcohol-free lotion would be less drying. Some drugs may cause your skin to become more sensitive to sunlight, so apply sunblock to any exposed skin areas if you plan to be outdoors. To protect your scalp, wear a hat or scarf when outdoors. If you must wash dishes by hand, protect your hands by wearing gloves. If you must do yard work or gardening, protect your hands and fingernails with rubber gloves and gardening gloves on top of them. If you do get a cut in your skin, make sure to thoroughly wash the area, apply an over-the-counter antibiotic cream or ointment, and a bandage. Change this three times each day. If you have a cut or sore that is not healing or one that shows signs of infection, such as redness or drainage, or if you develop any new rash or other change in your skin, please let your oncology team know as soon as possible. Hair loss is a side effect of cancer treatment that is distressing for many patients, women and men alike. The medical name for hair loss is alopecia. Hair loss includes scalp hair, body hair, and possibly eyebrows and eyelashes. However, not all cancer treatments cause hair loss, and some may only cause hair thinning. Hair thinning or hair loss usually begins about two to three weeks after beginning treatment. Your oncologist or the oncology team will let you know if the treatment you will be receiving is expected to cause alopecia. If hair loss is an expected side effect, your oncology team will provide you with information and a prescription for a wig. There are also resources available for people if their health insurance does not provide coverage for a wig. As distressing as losing your hair is, please know that it will begin to grow back after your treatment is finished. The texture or color may change some, but it will grow back. Some advice for managing hair loss is to keep your scalp clean and moisturized and remember to protect it from the sun with a cap or scarf if you are not wearing a wig. Wear a warm hat if going outside into the cold as you lose body heat if your head is uncovered. Some tips for managing hair thinning or for babying your hair as it is growing back include using a soft hairbrush, avoiding hot hair appliances like hair dryers or straighteners, or using them on the lowest possible setting if you must use them. Also, try to avoid chemicals such as hair dyes, perms, or chemical relaxers for straightening your hair. Using a satin pillowcase will help prevent tugging your hair as you toss and turn while sleeping. Eating a nutritious diet while you begin your cancer treatment is important. You should try to maintain your weight by including foods from the four food groups. Your body will rely on good nutrition to help it recover in between chemotherapy treatments. To help you maintain your weight, focus on protein sources such as meats, eggs, peanut butter, cottage cheese, and nuts. If you are losing weight, you can increase your calorie intake by adding things such as sour cream, butter, or melted cheese to vegetables, or you can include protein bars or protein drinks. Try to avoid eating snacks like chips or desserts like cake or ice cream as a regular part of your diet. If you experience any issues with your weight or diet during treatment, there are oncology dietitians available to help. It is just as important to stay well hydrated as it is to stay well nourished. It is ideal for you to drink two to three liters of fluid every day. Increasing your fluid intake is helpful for managing other symptoms that you might experience, such as constipation and fatigue. However, you don't need to drink only water, but we do recommend that you limit your caffeine intake, as excessive caffeine can actually lead to more fluid loss. 
which is called dehydration. If you need that morning cup of coffee or tea, that is fine. Just don't overdo it. If you are having problems with nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, please let your oncology team know. If you are able, drink frequent, small amounts of sports drinks. These drinks can help replace the electrolytes your body may have lost from vomiting or diarrhea. If nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea is prolonged or severe, you may need to visit the clinic for intravenous or IV fluids. Some patients will report that their appetite is poor because of the way foods taste when they eat. For some patients receiving chemotherapy, the taste buds may be affected, which interferes with your sense of taste. Other patients report they have a metallic taste in their mouth. While each person is different in what they will experience, here are a few suggestions for helping to manage this problem. First, try using plastic utensils if you are experiencing a metallic taste in your mouth. You should also develop a habit of rinsing your mouth vigorously with plain water right before you eat. This is called cleansing your palate. Sucking on hard candies can be helpful and also help keep your mouth moist. Lastly, you may hear a recommendation to avoid your favorite foods if you are having taste changes. While it seems unusual to say, some patients develop a negative association with one of their favorite foods because of this unpleasant side effect. However, it is up to you to experiment through trial and error. But rest assured, just like your other cells, your taste buds will likely recover over time once your chemotherapy treatment phase ends. We encourage you to take good care of your mouth while you're in treatment by gently brushing your teeth after meals and at bedtime using a soft toothbrush. You should also rinse your mouth four times daily using either an alcohol-free mouthwash or you can mix a solution of one cup of water with a half teaspoon of baking soda and a half teaspoon of salt every day. If you've been told that you are neutropenic, you should not floss, as bleeding of your gums can provide a pathway for bacteria from your mouth to your bloodstream. If you wear dentures, make sure they fit well. Poor-fitting dentures may lead to sores in your mouth. Make sure to clean them appropriately, and when you are not wearing them, store them in a cup of cool water to help them keep their proper shape. Check inside your mouth every day for any sores or white patches in the back of your throat. Make sure you contact your oncology team right away if you develop a mouth sore. It will feel similar to hitting your gum line with your toothbrush or biting the inside of your lip or cheek. If you have not done either of those things and feel a mouth sore, it is possible that is related to your treatment. There are some prescription treatments that your oncologist can order for you. We don't want you to develop any issues with eating or drinking, so report this as soon as possible. If you see white patches in the back of your throat, your oncologist may want to check you for a possible mild fungal infection called thrush. Your oncologist may treat this with a prescription from your pharmacy. However, this may be an early signal that your neutrophil count is low, so your blood counts may need to be checked. It is ideal if you are able to visit your dentist before you receive your first treatment. This is a good time for getting a cleaning and any simple treatments such as having a cavity filled. More complex dental procedures would need to wait until your treatment is finished as chemotherapy may affect wound healing. If a dental emergency should come up sometime during your treatment, your dentist and oncologist should discuss the best option for your situation. Sometimes, diarrhea may occur from your treatment. If you are receiving a drug that is likely to cause this to happen, 
Your oncology team will let you know the best way to manage it and when you should call them if you're having trouble managing it. Other times, you may experience diarrhea from something you ate, or it may be due to some type of foodborne illness. Whatever the cause, it is recommended that you call your oncology team if you have four or more loose or diarrhea episodes in a day. It is a good idea to have over-the-counter anti-diarrhea medication, such as loperamide, in your home, but it is best to take it only if your oncology team tells you to. Another suggestion for helping to manage diarrhea at home is to use the BRAT diet, which stands for bananas, rice, apples peeled or applesauce, and tea and toast. These foods may be called bland foods. You should stay away from foods with a lot of fiber, like bran cereal. Sometimes you may experience constipation due to your chemotherapy treatment or as a side effect from one of the other medications you are taking. A side effect of some anti-nausea medications is constipation. If your chemotherapy is likely to cause constipation, your oncology team will tell you how you should manage it. Some suggestions to help with this include drinking plenty of water, eating foods that will help promote a bowel movement, such as prunes or prune juice or bran cereals, and staying away from dairy products such as cheese. Getting regular exercise, such as walking or riding a stationary bike, may help keep your digestive system flowing smoothly. To help promote a regular bowel routine, Try to allow for at least 15 minutes after you eat breakfast to sit on the toilet, relax, and try to avoid straining. You might consider keeping an over-the-counter stool softener, such as docusate sodium, if the other suggestions have not helped, but make sure you talk to your oncology team first before taking them. Lastly, you can ask your oncologist what laxative they recommend if you continue to have difficulty having a bowel movement. Take care of the veins in your arms while you're receiving treatment. Having IVs in your arms or the need for lab specimens to be drawn from a vein in one of your arms can, over time, make finding a good vein difficult. A couple of suggestions to keep the veins in good shape are to squeeze a soft wall or sponge with your hands, as this squeezing motion helps strengthen the veins and muscles in your lower arms, and to try to stay well hydrated before your treatment. You can begin increasing your fluid intake one to two days before your appointment. When you're receiving treatment for cancer, you are at a higher risk for falling than people who do not have cancer you are also at risk for having a more severe injury if you fall while you are in treatment. You may feel weak from your treatments and not able to walk as far as you did before you started treatment. If your treatment has caused peripheral neuropathy, which was discussed earlier, you may have changes in sensation or balance that can cause you to fall. If your platelet count is low when you fall, you may experience a more severe injury because of large bruising or internal bleeding. If your cancer has affected your bones, that bone may be more prone to fracture if you fall. Please tell us when you arrive if you have had a recent fall or if you are feeling weak or unsteady. We would be happy to provide a wheelchair for you to use and assistance if you need it. Wheelchairs are available at the entrance to the cancer center. Please use our free valet parking services when you come for your treatments and appointments with your oncology team. You are not obligated to tip the valet staff. A wheelchair can be brought right up to your car if needed. Always remember that the wheels should be locked when getting into or out of a wheelchair. While you are receiving treatment or seeing your oncologist, please use the wheelchair to visit the restroom or 
for getting from one area to another to prevent a fall. Other recommendations for your safety include wearing comfortable athletic type shoes, such as walking shoes that fit your foot well and won't come off as you are walking. Footwear, such as flip-flops, bedroom slippers, and high-heeled shoes may cause you to fall. Wear comfortable clothing, such as track or yoga pants, something that will be easy to manage when you are using the bathroom. Whenever you are getting up from the treatment chair, please get up slowly. If your chair is reclined and you get up too quickly, you may become lightheaded or dizzy and you could fall. Please be aware that sometimes pre-medications for your treatment can cause you to feel woozy. One last thing, most of the equipment in the infusion area has wheels on it, so take care when getting up. Never lean on your IV pole for support. It is not a walking aid, and it will slide away from you if you fall. Our nursing staff is here to help you if you need. It is never a bother to assist you with your needs. We want you to be safe from falls when you visit our cancer center, but we also want you to be safe at home. Some things you can do at home to reduce your chances for falling are to remove any area rugs or runners from your floors. Have your furniture arranged so that your paths are clear for walking around your house. Keep your stairs and hallways free from clutter. Use lighting at the top and bottom of stairways. Have a sturdy handrail for your stairs or stoops. Use night lights after dark and put a non-skid mat in your shower or tub. You might want to consider installing grab bars in your shower or by your toilet to prevent a fall in your bathroom. If you were in the hospital at some point in your treatment journey, we want to help prevent you from falling there as well. We understand that while you were in the hospital, you may feel like you have less control over your environment. But sometimes, we may misjudge our own capabilities when we are not feeling well and in an unfamiliar place. Getting to or from the bathroom is the time in which a hospitalized patient is most likely to fall. Please follow the nursing staff's instructions regarding using the call bell and for getting help getting to and from the bathroom. Due to space constraints and regulatory mandates, there are limitations regarding visitors in the treatment area. Please make every effort to obtain care for any children that live with you and not bring them with you to your appointment. A television is in each treatment bay for your entertainment. You may also bring your own devices, such as laptops, tablets, or smartphones, and the staff can help you to access the complimentary Wi-Fi. Please bring headphones for your personal devices, and remember to make sure you take them home when you are discharged. The Cancer Center cannot be responsible for lost or stolen items. When you go home after your treatment, you and your family should practice chemotherapy precautions at home for 48 to 72 hours after the end of your treatment. As your body breaks down the drugs you received, there may be small amounts of them present in your body fluids. This includes your blood, feces, vomit, semen, and vaginal secretions. Casual contact, such as hugging, touching, or kissing is considered safe. Any family members or caregivers who are pregnant, breastfeeding, or trying to conceive a child should take care to avoid contact with any bodily fluids after treatment. If a caregiver or family member must clean up any body fluids that have spilled, they should wear disposable gloves and double bag the garbage. It may be disposed in the regular trash. Any laundry that is soiled with those body fluids should be washed twice in warm to hot water and dried in the dryer. The scheduling of your treatment is based on several factors. First, 
It may depend on how many hours your treatment is expected to take. For patients who will go home with a home infusion pump, also called an ambulatory infusion pump, your appointment will need to be scheduled on certain days early in the week in order to schedule the appointment to remove or disconnect the pump later in the week. Other times, it may need to be scheduled on a particular day because your oncologist may need to see you before you receive that treatment. This being said, it is important that the infusion area staff are informed of any delays in your arrival. We understand that there are sometimes circumstances beyond your control that may interfere with your timely arrival. If you experience any issues when traveling to your appointment, such as traffic, for example, please call to let the staff know you were on the way. It is always a good idea to leave earlier to allow for traffic delays. The highways leading to our campus are known to be congested at certain times of day, and traffic delays are an issue. When a patient arrives late for their infusion appointment, it causes a delay for the next patient scheduled. On the other side, if the patient ahead of you arrives late for their appointment, this may cause your appointment to be delayed. Depending on the length of time needed for your treatment, late arriving patients may need to have their appointment rescheduled. Let's talk about sexuality during your cancer treatment journey. Sexual activity is something that many people find to be physically, psychologically, and emotionally satisfying and is an important part of a couple's relationship. Sexual activity can improve your mood and decrease your stress because your body releases endorphins, which are hormones that increase our sense of pleasure and well-being and reduce pain. However, when you are receiving cancer treatments, there are precautions that are recommended. After a chemotherapy treatment, a period of abstinence from sexual activities in which the transfer of bodily fluids occurs is advisable. The reason for this is to protect the sexual partner from the breakdown products of the chemotherapy the patient received. If sexual activity is going to occur, a barrier method such as condoms or dental dams should be used for any oral sex or activity involving penetration. Recent literature suggests that the time frame for this includes the day of treatment and for one week afterward. For people who are of childbearing age, it is extremely important to use a reliable method of birth control to prevent pregnancy during this time. While cancer treatment may interfere with fertility for some people, others may remain fertile and conception could take place. If a pregnancy occurs during the time when one partner is undergoing treatment for cancer, the unborn baby, embryo or fetus, may not develop normally and may be born with defects or a miscarriage of the pregnancy may occur. You can discuss concerns with your oncologist about reliable birth control methods or for referral to resources for sperm banking or egg harvesting if you want to explore options for preserving your fertility. There are possible physical side effects from receiving cancer treatment. Depending on your type of cancer and how it is being treated, some side effects are temporary and some are easier to deal with. For example, women may experience vaginal dryness that leads to discomfort with vaginal intercourse. For men, sometimes erectile dysfunction may occur, impacting their ability to maintain an erection. If sexual expression is an important part of your relationship with your significant other, please ask your oncology team if there are any sexual side effects from your treatment. When you are undergoing cancer treatment, it is an emotional time of your life as well as your partner's. Sometimes, you or your partner may experience mixed emotions about having sex. You may feel like you do not have enough energy. 
or your partner may be afraid to initiate sex because they fear hurting you. Worries about family and financial matters may cause tension and less interest in sex. If your cancer treatment has affected your physical appearance, you might feel concerned about how attractive your partner may find you. Keeping an open and honest dialogue with your partner about your feelings and concerns is important to maintaining a good relationship. If you need additional support, your oncology team may be able to refer you to a specialist in this area. Now, let's change gears and talk about wellness for your mind, body, and soul. Becoming educated and informed about your treatment plan can help ease some of your worries. It is important to have an understanding of the goals of your treatment and the possible side effects of your treatment. Please keep in mind, the reported side effects of a particular treatment does not mean you are going to experience every one of those side effects. Some may be more likely than others to occur. However, by becoming more informed about them, you may feel more empowered to deal with them if they do occur. In addition to your oncologist, you should become familiar with the other members of the oncology team. There may be a nurse practitioner, or NP, or a physician's assistant, or PA, who works alongside your doctor, as well as a clinical coordinator nurse. It is always a good idea to keep a large calendar to help you stay on track with your appointments, as well as a notebook or a pad to write down any questions you have between visits. Please remember to bring it with you when you come for your appointment. If you wish to do additional reading online, please read information that is intended for patients only and that is specific to your diagnosis. Reading information that is intended for healthcare professionals may be difficult to decipher and can cause you to feel more stressed and anxious. Some cancer treatments can cause changes in your appearance, for example, hair loss, as we previously discussed. If your treatment is likely to cause hair loss and you are interested in obtaining a wig or hair prosthesis, that closely matches your current hair, it is best to get it before hair loss happens. Your oncologist can give you a prescription for a wig and it may be covered by your health insurance. If your insurance does not cover a wig, there are programs that offer wig assistance at little or no cost to you. Let me take this opportunity to tell you that the Stony Brook Cancer Center offers a number of support groups and other programs. Joining a support group can help you keep a positive attitude as you will be able to interact with others who are going through similar experiences as you are. Please ask for more information if you are interested. To help soothe your soul during this time of upheaval, try to partake in activities that you enjoy and methods to lower your stress level. If you have a hobby that you love, try to indulge in that whenever possible, if it is safe to do so. Also, don't forget the simple pleasures in life. If you enjoy the outdoors, go for a walk in nature and get some fresh air. Pets can bring your soul comfort and joy. Deep breathing practices and meditation can help you feel grounded and ease your stress. Listening to your favorite music or watching a favorite movie can help you forget about your cares for a while. Lastly, if spirituality brings peace and comfort to your soul and lessens your anxiety, then use this higher power to help you through this time. When you are receiving treatment for cancer, you may receive many offers for help with meals, errands, and household chores. Some of these offers will be sincere. It is up to you whether or not to accept help from outside your household. If you choose to accept help, please tell your family members and friends specifically how they can help. For example, mow the lawn is more specific than work in the yard. 
Another facet of communicating with others who were concerned about you is how much information you would like them to know about your condition. There is no right or wrong here. It is just that some people are very open about their diagnosis and their treatment, and others prefer to keep it private, sharing information with only a few people close to them. Finding ways to stay organized can help ease your anxiety and make your medical visits go more smoothly. In addition to a list of questions you have, it is really important to always have a current list of your medications and bring it with you to each visit. Sometimes, a medication prescribed by another physician can change between visits, so it is essential that we know so your medical record can be updated. Having a current medication list is vital in case you need to visit the emergency department of another hospital, where they won't have access to our computerized records. If a member of your oncology team uses a medical term that you are not familiar with, please ask them to clarify it for you. We want you to be informed about your care, so it is okay to ask. Some people find that starting a personal journal is helpful. You don't need to write a lot every day, just a few sentences about how you are feeling, especially after treatment and a few days afterward. Doing this may help you to recognize patterns or trends. You can track symptoms such as nausea or fatigue. It is also a good way to keep track of certain lab values, such as your hemoglobin, platelet, and neutrophil counts. It may also be a good idea to keep a calendar, notebook, and papers in a small accordion file that you can bring with you. There are several websites where you can find additional information about cancer and cancer treatments. The National Cancer Institute, or NCI, is a federal agency under the National Institutes of Health, which provides information about cancer in general, as well as specific cancer types, and it is written in easily understandable language. You can find NCI at www.cancer.gov. The American Cancer Society, ACS, and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, LLS, are also organizations that offer patient information as well as programs that can offer assistance to patients and their families. The American Cancer Society can be found at www.cancer.org and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society can be found at www.lls.org. These organizations will not ask for any form of payment from you as they raise money through fundraising efforts to be able to provide these services. Be cautious of websites that are .com. Some of these sites are truly legitimate resources, but some may be commercial in nature and looking to sell you something. Lastly, the Stony Brook Cancer Center website. We recommend you check it out. If you have any questions, please let your oncology team and the Cancer Center staff know. You can direct questions to your oncologist, the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant, the nurse coordinator who works with your oncologist, or the nursing staff in the infusion area. Again, please remember for urgent matters or emergencies when the cancer center is closed, please call 631-689-8333 and ask for the Oncology Fellow on call. It may be a good idea to program this number into your mobile phone ahead of time. This concludes our presentation. We thank you for taking the time to watch and listen to the information presented. Please bring any questions you may have to your oncology team so that we may address your concerns and worries. And once again, thank you for choosing the Stony Brook Cancer Center for your care and treatment.